Hello, and welcome back to AI Art Part 2. It's been an exciting six months since we last ran this course, and so I'm very much looking forward to diving into some of the new advances with you. Um, what's the plan for the second half? Well, today is going to be a bit of a refresher. And when we ran Lesson 5 as a live stream, um, I went in quite a lot of depth for those who hadn't done Lessons 1 through 3. Um, but for this video, I'm going to give more of a high-level overview just to sort of orient you within the notebook. So if you'd prefer to see that longer, I think it's more than an hour in-depth video, I'll link that as an unlisted video in the description of this one. Um, but if you have come along since the beginning and you're more familiar with these concepts, this video instead is going to be more just an orientation to the notebook to give you enough um, information to dive in and explore yourself and hopefully set up for following weeks. So that's today, lesson five. We're just going to be going over a few key ideas and then um, lesson six and seven is where we're going to get into the real meat of some of these new, more advanced techniques. So I'm still not sure which order we'll do it. It was going to be Transformers and VQGAN revisited, but with the recent announcement of DALI 2, I know the excitement is all around diffusion models. So I might switch the order of those two. And then as we go further past that, we'll look at more sort of novel generation methods, right? Uh, neural cellular automata, um, siren, possibly um, working with 3D meshes and other more unusual types of data, even video. Um, and then lesson nine, depending on the feedback from you, the students, um, we might dive into some, some other topics as well. So we'll have a, a dedicated channel on Discord for each of these. If you aren't already in the Discord, there's gonna be an up-to-date link in the Air Art GitHub. And this is where you'll also find links to the collab notebooks for each of these and a YouTube playlist with all of these videos so that you can follow along through the course at your own pace. Um, okay, so that's the, the sort of plan going forward. Um, for today, this notebook is gonna run through a few key building blocks that we covered in part one, um, but just kind of recapping those ideas and exploring. So section one, optimization. This was something we originally covered in the first lesson, right? We talked about introductory stuff, creating tenses and so on. Um, but then the key part was this gradient descent and automatic differentiation. Um, and so that's what we're recapping here. How exactly do neural networks learn, right? So there's this little live demo that we look at um, where you can watch a network kind of learn a simple function in real time. Um, but we're going to explore what exactly is happening under the hood there. What is this optimization or training that we talk about and how does that work? Um, so the first sort of exploration we'll do of that is training a network for classification because the kind of generic statement that we talk about is we have um, some function that opt optionally takes some input and produces some output based on a set of parameters and these parameters could be weights in a neural network they could be you know numbers in a mathematical formula at some some sort of set of numbers that control the output and then we have some measure of how well that does um, so to explore this idea, we look at this kind of classic example, which is image classification, right? We have these little handwritten digits, um, zero through nine, and we'd like to predict which digit a given image contains. And so we look at a couple of different little network definitions, right? Starting with a very simple, you know, two layer um, MLP neural network and saying, okay, you know, each of these has some set number of parameters. And then moving up to a convolutional neural networks, so just slightly more complicated. But the key takeaway here is we can plug together these building blocks provided by PyTorch. And um, within that, our network is then going to have a set of parameters which we can optimize. And so we saw our first training loop where we create our model. We specify some loss. That's our measure of how well the model does. And then we use uh, one of the built-in optimizers on the parameters of the model and we're going to iteratively try and change those parameters until the model performs in a way that we want. Um, so we're saying we're running through the data, we're going to zero out any gradient calculations that have happened before, we're going to get our model outputs, right? in this case the predictions on which digit is which, um, we're going to calculate our loss, we're going to call loss.backwards to propagate those errors back, and then we're going to call optimizer.step to update the parameters. And we saw in this little example, over time, the network gets better and better and better until it reaches 85, 89, 90%, 95% accuracy. You can try both types of model. Um, you can explore giving them more parameters by adding more hidden layers or something. Um, and you can see how that changes the performance. Um, but the idea here is not to be a course on building neural networks for image classification. 
it's more to just get this idea and generalize that this is what we do when we would like to train something um, to produce an output that is desirable. We measure how desirable the output is via some loss, and then we use this gradient descent algorithm whereby we say how do we tweak each individual parameter, what is the gradient of the loss with respect to that parameter, that gives me a direction to adjust that parameter, and then we use an optimizer, in this case one of the built-in ones, to do those adjustments in small increments so that over time the network gets better and better and better. So that was kind of part one, recapping the ideas from lesson one um, to say we can, we can kind of treat this as a general tool. Um, so that's key idea number one of this recap, and that's going to be something that we use again and again going into these more advanced models. Um, section two dives a little bit more into how exactly we define our loss, because um, that kind of is the core part of, of a lot of this type of um, work, right? By specifying what we call desirable, the kinds of outputs we would like, um, we can train a network to produce those outputs. So we looked at some different examples. If we're trying to predict a continuous variable, we would use something like the mean squared error. How far away on average are the predictions from the actual values? Um, but we can also have types of losses that um, don't directly look at the outputs, but rather some property of the network itself or of the parameters. Um, for example, regularization, we try and keep the parameters from being too extreme. Um, we also have things like contrastive losses, which we'll talk about in the next section to do with CLIP and other kinds of sort of semi-supervised learning. Um, then we have fancy ones like perceptual loss or content loss in the context of style transfer, right? Where we want to measure using some big pre-trained network, um, different types of features. So we said these large network learn, you know, fine-grained textual details, and then they put them together into sort of larger categorical um, parameters and, and sort of as you go deeper in the network you get more and more information and so we can use that to say two images might look alike despite the fact that the pixels are different right they still have the same overall structure um, so we can compare that on overall structure or we can use some tricks to instead focus on those earlier layers and compare them only on texture without worrying about structure so we can craft these kind of more interesting custom losses and there's many more, right? You can come up with, with custom penalties all day long, and you'll see, especially in things like reinforcement learning, really complicated and interesting multi-part loss functions. Um, but the idea here is that whatever our loss function is, we're just defining what we would like to maximize or minimize, and we're using that to push things in that direction. Um, so there's a classic blog post that talks about this, highly recommend going and reading that. And this is just um, Karpathy, who's the head of self-driving at Tesla, really eloquently articulating this exact idea. Um, in normal programming, we write out a set of instructions to explicitly say, this is what you should do. Um, in software 2.0, with these deep learning methods, we instead specify what we want, and we have the computer learn how to do that, right? By optimizing a set of parameters in one of these deep neural networks. So that's the core idea. And to, to show that out, we're gonna do a quick example, which is style transfer. This is something that's talked about in more detail in lesson two. Um, so you can get you know, um, a deep in introduction to what a convolutional network is, how we use that for style transfer. Um, but in this notebook, we're just gonna use that as a demo to say, we in this case are gonna do, um, we're gonna try and optimize such that we get um, high sort of content similarity to one image and high textural or stylistic similarity to another. And to do that, we're just gonna use our same sort of training loop right this is the same steps as before so the gradients get our outputs calculate our loss loss dot backwards optimize dot step except in this case our loss is not just a single equation it's a combination of our style loss and our content loss and we see how we can tune that we can choose how much weight to assign to each one by varying some parameters and in the end we end up with this um sort of really cool neat artistic demo something that was mind-blowing to everybody five years ago and is kind of run of the mill now um, and that is style transfer so really neat little demo if you'd like to play with that there's a standalone version there's more information in lesson two um, and maybe one little interesting tweak of this is that instead of optimizing the raw the, the parameters of a network or the raw pixels of an image like we did in, in lesson two uh, we instead have some sort of alternate representation of an image using this imstack library and so all this does is, um, excuse my slow internet, <laughs> this takes an image and it represents it as a stack of tensors at different resolutions. 
And what that means is that a change to a single pixel in one of these lower layers affects multiple pixels in the output. So it gives the network a chance to make a larger change versus tweaking you know, a single pixel is only going to change the output image a small amount. But by having this kind of hierarchical representation, um, and we'll see that in the next demo as well, um, it just helps the learning a little bit to have a more efficient representation. And this is going to be an idea that take, we'll take even further once we get to part three of this notebook. Um, okay, so that was that idea. Um, final part of this loss section is just talking a little bit about this idea of contrastive loss, because this is the key behind something like clip, right? This is the architecture diagram for clip, where in this case, we have a specific goal. We'd like to be able to associate images and text. Um, and so to accomplish this, it's a very clever formulation of a loss function. Um, so the idea here, we have two very disparate modes of data, right? We have text, which is like a sequence of words or tokens, and we have images, which is these big sort of multi-dimensional tenses of, of individual pixel values. And we'd like to map these into the same space so that we can compare them. Um, and so to do that, Clip uses a text encoder, right? Often, a, I think, a transformer model um, and an image encoder, which they have various different architectures. Um, but the core idea here is the same. These each output a 512 dimensional vector, right? So whatever your input text or input image is, it's going to give out 512 numbers that try to represent that text. And initially, obviously, this is not going to work at all because those numbers aren't, are not going to be associated. So the loss function, the, the core part of this, is the way we measure whether or not the network's doing what we want. And so to do that, you put a whole lot of images through and a whole bunch of text through. And then each image text pair, you want there to be a high similarity. So this is the embedding of image one, embedding of text one that goes with that image. We would like this similarity between these two to be quite high. And the same for all of the ones along the diagonal. We want high similarity for those pairs because they should go together, right? Ozzy the pepper pup should go with a picture of the puppy. Um, conversely, the other images that we feed in shouldn't necessarily match this text. And so the rest of these similarities should be low, right? So that's how they formulate their loss function. We want a high similarity between image text pairs that should be similar and a low similarity everywhere else. And then they feed um, a set of text and images through. They measure these, they quantify how well did it do on that objective. And then they use that to update the weights in their image and text encoders so that the next time it hopefully does a slightly better job. And suddenly in the core there is something very much like the optimization loops we've been using, right? Run some images and text through, measure how well it does keeping the similarities the way we want, update the parameters of these giant networks to improve that performance. And over time, this learns to do these, these sort of embeddings really well. Um, and we can see that in practice. So we can load up one of their clip models, we can encode some text and see that we get 512 numbers out. And the same thing for the image, right? And so suddenly we can measure how similar is this piece of text with this piece of imagery. Um, and that gives us a really great tool. So of course we can use this in an optimization loop, right? So again, we're gonna be optimizing a, an image stack, just effectively an image pyramid where we wanna produce some image output, um, set it up with an optimizer, zero the gradients, get our output. Only this time to measure our loss, we're gonna encode the image with clip and we're gonna compare that encoding with the encoding of our text, right? A watercolor painting of a submarine. Um, and we would like to minimize the distance between them um, or maximize the similarity. And so the way we've set it up, it does that, last up backwards, optimize the dot step. And sure enough, over time, the network gets closer and closer and closer to a situation where it looks kind of like a submarine underwater. And so this next cell just wraps that up, tweaks some parameters, sets up a, a, a better image stack and um, does more sort of little optimizations under the hood. And if you run that, you'll very quickly see, hopefully, something in the output that vaguely matches the input text, right? And so this is by no means a sort of state-of-the-art text-to-image system, but it is a fun way to explore this idea that we can take some parameters, in this case, the pixel values in this image stack, and we can compare them to text using clip which itself has been trained in this very um, sort of useful contrastive way. And what we get out is a pretty picture from some text. Um, and so the only difference between this and the latest greatest state of the art models is that they're using something a bit more complicated than a stack of raw pixels being optimized. Um, but this key idea is, is something that's really fun and we can apply this in all sorts of ways. 
Um, okay, so that's most of that section. One little addendum that's uh, come out in the six months since we looked at Clip is um, all the various improvements. So there's been there's been multiple Clip, Blip, etc. Um, one that se seems really uh, promising at the moment is Clube, and the the sort of the downside of Clip it definitely did have higher similarity between images and text that should go together. But absolute similarity still wasn't that high. Um, so Klub tries to ad address this by bringing the image embeddings and the text embeddings closer together such that they really do occupy the same space. And they do that with these sort of modern hop field networks, which you can just interpret as magic. Um, but it means that um, Klub, if you've got a choice between Clip and Klub, Klub is going to give you even more cohesive embeddings, right? The embedding for an image and the caption of that image might be really highly similar. Um, such that we can do all sorts of neat tricks based on that. So we'll see this used when we talk about clue guided latent diffusion in an upcoming lesson. Um, but for this, I just wanted to, wanted to throw it out there that Clip is really cool and has been the sort of foundational model of a lot of advances in the last year or two. Um, but there are sort of improvements to that coming out. Okay, so there's a few different um, versions of this text to image via image stack. Um, there's also a little live demo on Hugging Face Spaces that uses the same idea to do some artistic effects. I'm not going to look at those in too much depth now. Um, instead, let's just look at the final section of this notebook, um, section three, getting to grips with latent space. So I mentioned already, if you're optimizing the raw pixels of an image, trying to match some loss, that's not super efficient. First of all, because every parameter doesn't affect much of the overall output. Um, and secondly, yeah, it's, you just have a lot of data that you're dealing with. It's quite noisy. Um, so image stack, right? Having this sort of hierarchical representation where we have different resolutions stacked together, that's marginally better, right? You generally see, um, you know, suddenly a change here can have a larger effect on the output. That's a positive thing, um, but it's still not ideal. So instead, um, there are sort of much more purpose-built networks that are designed to generate a really nice output um, given some compressed representation. And so in lesson three, we talked about this. We talked about um, autoencoders and GANs. Um, so the idea here is we're just going to explore this idea, right? Um, we have networks that, that go from some low dimensional latent space up to a final output. And instead of optimizing an image directly, we can optimize a vector in this latent space, right? This sort of the, the, the number that's fed into this generator, which then expands that out into a final image. Um, and in doing that, we can have um, a really nice system where a small tweak to that might affect the whole output image and in a very sort of controllable way. And so that's what's behind a lot of the clip guided techniques like Big Sleep, the QGAN and Clip, et cetera. Um, and so we're gonna play around in this notebook with a small demo. Um, so this GAN is based on a lightweight GAN architecture. Um, it's up on Hugging Face, so it's quite easy to load the model. And you can see the outputs are, in this case, nothing super realistic, nothing painterly, no faces, no humans, no dogs, just little glowy round orbs. And that's because that's the data it was trained on. That's the artistic effect I was going for. Um, but it makes for a nice demo. So we can do a couple of things with this to kind of get more intuition for latent space. We can start with a simple interpolation, right? So we pick two random points, two random points, each of size 256 because the latent space of this particular generator is 256 dimensional. Um, so we pick these two points and each of them is gonna generate some output. And if we move between them, we can watch how the output morphs from one to the other. Um, so in this case, our starting point looks kind of like this little blue guy. And as we move through latent space, we move further and further towards the destination, which happens to be a very different output. Um, and we can play around with making a video of this kind of idea, right, moving between more points in a loop. And you can see how this output kind of continuously morphs in a really interesting way um, as we move through this latent space. So we moving in some direction defined by 256 numbers and the output is changing and the output is in this case a 256 by 256 pixel image. So way more information on the output, um, but we can kind of just move around in this latent space and have some big effect on the final image. Um, so given this, we can then say, well, why don't we optimize on with the, the parameters that we're optimizing being the, the point in latent space, right? Those 256 numbers. And we want to optimize those to get some desirable property on the output. Um, so feeding on from our discussion about custom losses earlier, um, we said, well, what if we wanted 
some particular effect. I would like the average color in the center of the image to be this kind of dark orange, and I'd like the outer part of the image to be black, right? That was my loss function. So we said, I'm gonna take the average of this, um, the difference between the mean color of the image and the target colors, that's gonna be part of my loss. And then the other part is gonna be how close the outer sort of strip of pixels is to um, being an average color of zero. So that's two different components to this loss function. Um, and that's me just expressing what I want in a mathematical way. So once we have that, we can optimize towards that. We start with some random latents, and then we're going to iteratively zero the gradients, calculate our outputs if we feed those latents through our generator, um, get the mean color, calculate the loss, loss dot backwards, optimize the dot step. And so that's kind of the, the one key takeaway of this whole notebook is that this, this loop kind of looks the same no matter where you go. Um, and then we can view the results. So we started out with these four images on the left here, right? Two were kind of close to what we wanted. Two were completely the wrong color. Um, and then after only 20, 20 steps, they all look on average kind of orangey and none of them have a horrible white background or anything like that. Um, so that's exactly achieving kind of what we want. It's not perfect. This GAN is limited in what it can generate. So if our output, if our loss was how well does the output look exactly like you know, a highly detailed pointillism oil painting, we are probably gonna be disappointed. But if we just want some vaguely colored orbs, that's what it's good at. And so the final demo is just saying, well, we can do that. Why don't we do that same kind of optimization for every pixel in an image and get some kind of big output. It's not super impressive, <laughs> but it does demonstrate the point that if we have some artistic vision and we can express what we want as a loss function, then we can find a way of optimizing towards that and who knows, it might be a pretty picture that comes out at the end of the day. So that's the lesson. Um, I, I'm glad this is 20 minutes and not an hour and 20 minutes like the live stream. But like I said, if you do want to go into more detail, if you want to see me running this code, debugging, exploring, I will link that down below. Um, but we had some technical difficulties, so I thought I'd rather re-record as a summary. Um, and then hopefully in the next week or so, you'll be able to join me for the next lesson where we'll look at either diffusion models or transformers, um, but something that's gonna be a little bit more complex. And yet we'll see, we can approach it with the same idea. Start with some parameters, you know, define our architecture using existing building blocks, um, specify some loss and find, find the loss and use that to update our parameters. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat until we get what we, what we want. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed that. Do leave any questions in the Discord chat, which is linked again from this AI art GitHub link. And all of these links will also be in the description of the video. Come along, ask questions, and I look forward to seeing you next week for lesson six. Cheers for now.